Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the opening of the 2013-2014 series of Grand Rounds for the Department of Psychiatry. And initiating our first Grand Rounds of the academic year is Susan Collins, PhD. She's a licensed clinical psychologist and research assistant professor at our university and Harborview. She has had over 15 years of experience in alcohol treatment research and has disseminated this work in four dozen book chapters, abstracts, and peer-reviewed articles. Her current research program focuses on developing and evaluating harm reduction and motivational interventions targeting substance use disorders as well as integrating qualitative, quantitative, and community-based participatory methods to more comprehensively investigate causes and correlates of initiation, maintenance, and change in substance use behaviors. She currently holds a Career Transition Award from NIAAA and is a recent awardee of the G. Allen Marlatt Memorial Research Award for Contributions to Alcohol Research. Dr. Collins. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm going to be taught, and thank you for the kind introduction, Sharon. Um, so I will be talking uh, today about a pilot study that we recently completed on medication-supported harm reduction for chronically homeless people with alcohol dependence. And even though I'm presenting solo today, um, this is part of a much larger research effort, so I'm going to acknowledge my colleagues who are um, playing a role in this work as well at the end of the presentation. So first of all, I'll introduce the study population. I'll talk a little bit about um, chronically homeless um, individuals and um, the, uh, the correlation between alcohol dependence and homelessness. I'll talk a little bit about the study rationale and the design. I'll present some of our findings and I will talk about um, some of our initial conclusions and next steps. So first of all, what is chronic homelessness? Well, we use the, federally, uh, the federal definition. It is an unaccompanied homeless individual with a disabling condition who has been continuously homeless for a year or more or has had four or more episodes of homelessness in the past three years. Now you can see the chronically homeless population makes up a smaller subset of the larger homeless population. But they're important for us to focus on because uh, they are multiply affected by substance use, psychiatric, and medical disorders, and they're often marginalized and have difficulty accessing uh, treatment and health care. So why are we talking about alcohol use and homelessness together? Well, we know that they're co-occurring conditions with real consequences. First of all, we know the prevalence of alcohol use among homeless individuals is as high as 80%. Alcohol dependence prevalence is 38% um, on average worldwide among homeless individuals. And to give you a point of comparison, that's 10 times higher than it is in the general U.S. population. Alcohol dependence, as many of you know, is also associated with increased morbidity and mortality, and that can be due to acute causes such as falls, accidents, suicide, interpersonal violence, or due to more chronic conditions like cancer or liver disease. And these consequences not only affect the individual themselves, but place undue cost and utilization burden on our healthcare system. So then probably everyone's thinking, well, we should just make our available treatments more available and more accessible for this population. But what we know is that even though abstinence-based treatments um, are the treatment of choice and really the only available choice for uh, people in this population, um, research has shown that most homeless people never go to, are turned away from, or drop out of abstinence-based treatments. Those who are there are typically mandated, either formally or informally, um, with some kind of legal pressure. And in our quality of research, where we talk to a lot of homeless individuals, these kinds of treatments are often deemed not effective, acceptable, and or desirable. And the reason why is we found in our own research that um, chronically homeless individuals have been through a mean of 16 treatment episodes. That's the mean. Um, so that you can imagine that sort of learned helplessness um, over time has not really um, made them think very positively about their chances for the next round of treatment. And also for the people who stay in treatment, um, we found that they're not really that effective. They produce modest effects that are often pretty transient. And in some cases, abstinence-based treatment, one more round of abstinence-based treatment may actually increase the risk of harm. And the reason why is because even when a person goes through medically supervised withdrawal, if you increase that number over and over again, and many of our 
um, participants report wanting to go to treatment basically just to take a vacation from their substance use, right? Because it's a full-time job being alcohol dependent. You got to get the substance, use the substance, recover from the substance. So they want to take a break. So they'll go to treatment with the intent of returning to alcohol use. That means they go through all the electrochemical changes in their brain, even with a medically supervised withdrawal, that can contribute to a kindling effect. So the next time they pick up use, they may have more and more severe uh, withdrawal symptoms. And we do see that in a lot of our participants. So all of these findings taken together really highlights the need for additional pathways to recovery. And um, my team and I think that harm reduction approaches can provide that alternate pathway. Um, harm reduction refers to a, sort of a set of low threshold and user-driven, compassionate and pragmatic approaches that aim to reduce substance-related harm and improve quality of life for affected individuals and their communities. Now the catch here is that harm reduction interventions don't um, really stipulate any particular goals for clients. Um, we really work on eliciting goals from clients and we do not require use reduction and in its most extreme case, abstinence from clients. So harm reduction has come to be applied uh, with homeless people with alcohol use disorders, um, but typically what we've seen so far is that's in the form of housing interventions or shelter-based interventions. So these interventions haven't really been created by us, the substance use treatment professionals, but by housing agencies who are desperate to serve this population and engage them into services. Um, and what we found so far is that harm reduction approaches um, that are uh, housing-based um, are preferred by clients and staff working with homeless clients. And in our qualitative research, we've actually talked to staff members, many of whom are uh, chemical dependency counselors, and they will tell us, you know, I believe in 100% abstinence, but that's just not feasible for this population, and harm reduction is really the only way to engage and work with these folks. So most of these housing-based interventions um, are, uh, basically, you could consider them under the umbrella of housing first interventions. Um, how many people have been in my housing first talk? <laughs> so we'll go through that much further. But in a sentence, housing first implies the uh, provision of immediate, permanent, low barrier, non abstinence based housing. Um, and when I say low barrier, it means taking away the typical stipulations for housing, like achieving milestones like clinical stability, or attending your health care appointments, or, your, um, or becoming abstinent, or um, attending substance abuse treatment. And what we found is housing first, or harm reduction housing, is associated with reduced publicly funded service utilization and associated costs. It's also associated, perhaps paradoxically, with reduced sub alcohol and other drug use and related problems. And the reason why we believe that happens is because housing provides a foundation from which people can start to make positive behavior changes on their own terms and on their own time. So we found that housing-based ha um, harm reduction interventions for alcohol dependence really are a positive way forward. But as Bill Hobbs and the executive director of DESC puts it, we know it's about housing first. Now what comes second? And he looked at us at that point and said, so what should we do? <laughs> and we uh, realized we didn't have any answers. Um, there are really no combined behavioral or pharmacological counterparts or really any behavioral or pharmacological counterparts to further support and enhance these positive housing effects that we've seen. Um, and so we decided to uh, work on that, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. It's a pilot study um, that I worked on um, that was spearheaded, actually, by Dr. Rick Reese down here in the front row. Um, and uh, Rick came to me and said, you know, I think this would be a great medication for this population. And I had worked with this clinically on the East Coast because I went, I did my uh, pre-doctoral internship at Yale University, where a lot of the research with naltrexone has been done. And it was a matter of course for us to give all of our um, alcohol-dependent clients oral naltrexone um, daily dose. Um, and so I felt really comfortable with that, but I said only if we can use harm reduction counseling paired with that, so no abstinence-based approach for this population. And so that led us to combine sort of this medication with harm reduction counseling um, with the hope of reducing alcohol-related harm for people who are both housed in a housing-first setting to augment those effects and also for people who are still homeless um, with the hope of helping them um, start to make positive behavior changes. So to give you a little bit of background about extended release naltrexone or XRMTX, the market name is Vivitra. It is a 30-day extended release formulation of the opioid receptor antagonist naltrexone. 
It's administered monthly via gluteal intramuscular injection, so a shot in the butt. It binds to mu, delta, and kappa opioid receptors in decreasing order of affinity, particularly the mu and delta opioid receptors. And that's believed to then inhibit the activity of endogenous opioids that may be released during alcohol consumption. So what that basically means is we believe that when people drink alcohol, it induces naturally occurring opioids or endorphins into the brain, which creates sort of like a runner's high, except you're really just high. So, um, and, and so basically what that does, and naltrexone does, is it sits in that receptor, and it blocks all of the opioids from reaching the receptor. And at the same time, it, um, in people who have a lot of cravings, such as alcohol-dependent people, um, it will act as sort of a pacifier, pacifying the mouths of all your, cry your, all your receptors who are crying out for alcohol. So it has sort of a dual purpose. And the hypothesized clinical actions that we've also seen reported by our clients that we work with um, are that it reduces alcohol craving, it decreases the stimulatory effects of alcohol, especially at the higher levels of use, it increases alcohol's depressant effects, and it improves executive functioning and pulse control, probably because it interrupts that pleasure pathway and reward pathway. So there were a few signals to us that XRNTX might be a positive way to approach harm reduction. No one had yet tried it for harm reduction, but um, J.C. Garbutt, um, who did the first XRNTX trial, started to include people who were still using, and that had never really been done before. Um, he showed that XRNTX is safe and effective <laughs> in reducing craving and heavy drinking, even among individuals who drink. Up until that point, naltrexone had really been used for people who had been through treatment, had achieved abstinence, and it was used as a way to reduce craving to, um, to prevent relapse. And then uh, folks out at Yale University, Robert Lehman and Stephanie O'Malley, showed that oral naltrexone uh, can be used for drinking moderation goals, so to help people um, moderate their drinking, particularly college students with alcohol dependence before they go out um, for one of their evenings of college binge drinking. So these studies kind of gave us the idea that XRNTX is safe and effective for people who are continuing to use alcohol, um, and potentially it could be used as a pharmacological support for harm reduction goals. So the aims of our study were to assess the feasibility, safety, and alcohol outcomes following uh, naltrexone administration and harm reduction counseling, and then to develop and pilot procedures for a larger RCT, um, which we then submitted to NIAAA as an R01, a five-year R01. Um, our design was a very basic one, single arm, open label, three month pilot. We worked with 31 chronically homeless individuals with alcohol dependence. Um, these were actually individuals with histories of chronic homeless, about half and half, and I'll talk about the population in just a bit, or the sample in just a bit. We tried to keep the inclusion and exclusion criteria as low barrier as possible in keeping with a harm reduction approach. Um, so we uh, did not use all the typical, typical exclusion criteria but we did exclude people who were potential safety risk to staff or themselves, people who had liver transaminase levels above five times the upper limit of normal, um, opioid dependence, um, obviously because this is an opioid uh, receptor blocker, so that would be a problem. Um, we didn't want people going to acute opioid withdrawal. People who were pregnant or nursing, who had a known allergy, um, who were currently using naltrexone for the past year suicide attempt, um, renal insufficiency or decompensated liver disease. And our measures were self-reported alcohol use problems and cravings. Um, we also uh, looked at alcohol-related biomarkers so that we were able to provide um, some bio validation for people who are concerned that self-report in this population or really in any population might be questionable about alcohol use. And what did our harm reduction counseling session look like? I'm not sure. Um, Mark, are you here? Brian? No. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to see if one of the study physicians was around, um, but basically when uh, one of the study physicians was providing the session, um, they would come in, record vital signs, weight, medications that participants were taking. Um, they provided personalized feedback about alcohol assessment and lab tests, and this was done in a really non-judgmental way, basically eliciting um, participants' reactions to hearing about um, their, uh, the outcomes of their initial assessments. Then they elicited participants' harm reduction goals, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that looked in just a second. They assessed adverse events and side effects, also at baseline. And this was really tricky because um, <clears throat> one of the issues with XRNTX is its side effect profile basically overlaps almost one-to-one -one 
with the side effects of alcohol dependence, basically with acute withdrawal, which is what our clients go through pretty much every morning. Um, so nausea, vomiting, headache, um, dizziness, um, those kinds of effects. Um, and then uh, they provided medication management, talked about managing side effects, the risks, the potential <coughs> benefits, and checked to be sure people were wearing their ID tags, that they were on uh, XRNTX. And then they discussed safer drinking strategies, and I'll talk about that as well in just a few minutes. And finally, they got a shot in the butt. So to elicit how harm reduction goes, actually the question was very simple. Um, we just had the study physicians ask, so, you know, we're going to be together for the next three months. What would you like to see happen for yourself? Or what would you like to work on in here with me? And um, basically it was pretty open-ended, um, and the, the physicians then uh, uh, wrote down uh, participants' goals for stated goals on the case report form. And then, as you can see here, um, each time a person came back, those goals were revisited and it was documented whether progress was achieved, yes or no, or, um, or whether the actual goal was completely achieved. And they also discussed safer drinking strategies, and this was introduced by saying, um, introducing a list of these, and then the physician said, this is a list of things you can do to drink more safely. Have you ever tried doing anything on this list before? How did that go? Would you be willing to try one of these out over the next week? And um, usually participants had expressed trying out some of these safer drinking tips before, and so the physician's job there was to support self-efficacy and be encouraging about the positive changes they've already been able to make in their lives. I don't need y'all to read all of this, I just wanted to give you an idea of what the handout looked like. Um, but basically the, the um, safer drinking uh, strategies were grouped into three groups. Ways to stay healthier when you drink, so ways to not really change anything about the drinking per se, but um, to buffer the effects of that on the body. The second category was ways to make drinking safer, um, so changing, if you will, the style of drinking. And the last group is sort of the classic group, so ways to change the amount that a person's consuming. Um, we were careful, though, if a person had reduction in abstinence goals, um, to really um, look closely with them to taper. Um, because alcohol withdrawal, as I mentioned before, is a real issue with this particular sample. And so the interventions came together like this. We did a baseline assessment. Um, I actually did the assessments, the um, self-report assessments, and a study physician handled all of the medical assessments in the session. Um, in week zero, the participants received the XRNTX and the harm reduction counseling from the physician. Um, and in week one, harm reduction counseling, that was our safety checkup, just to see how people were feeling a week after they received their first injection. At week four, they received the injection and harm reduction counseling again, and again at week eight. At week 12, they received the harm reduction counseling, and that was basically considered the end of the treatment period. And we didn't have a follow-up that lasted beyond that for this particular pilot. So to give you an idea of what these participants look like demographically, um, you can see this was a very male-dominated population, which is not atypical for chronically homeless people with alcohol dependence. Um, they all had histories of chronic homelessness. Many of them have been homeless from their teens, so um, basically have lived on the streets most of their adult lives. 45% um, were currently homeless, and we worked with um, Evergreen Treatment Services REACH Homeless Outreach Program to see them either at their downtown office or uh, we worked with sobering center staff and we saw um, people at the sobering center, so right after they woke up and before they went into withdrawal. It was kind of, it was a window of time that we would catch people. Um, and then uh, the uh, people who were formerly homeless but now have housing were recruited from DESC's 1811 East Lake. And the mean age uh, was 50. The education level is relatively diverse. And you can see um, the uh, racial and ethnic breakdown was also relatively diverse for the Seattle area. Um, and I want to just draw your attention to this particular um, side of the graph. Um, the American Indian, Alaska Native, and First Nation representation, um, as is typical in this population, is disproportionately represented. Just to give you a point of comparison, the representation of this group in the greater Seattle metropolitan area is 1%. So um, this population is clearly disproportionately affected by alcohol dependence and chronic homelessness. And to give you an idea of how these people drink, um, fortunately 100% met criteria for alcohol dependence, otherwise it would not have done much because it was an inclusion criterion. Um, but 
I also want to point out that 91.7 experienced alcohol withdrawal symptoms. So this wasn't just a, a psychologically dependent population, but a very severely physically dependent population as well. Uh, 30 was the median number of drinking days in the past month, so pretty much every day. Um, and 19 was the number of standard drinks people reported consuming on a typical drinking day in the past 30 days. So how we asked that question was, you know, in the past 30 days, just on a regular drinking day for you, what did you drink? And then they would name the brands, the type of alcohol, the size container. We nailed them down pretty much. If they were passing around a bottle, we asked how many people they were sharing it with. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, although a lot of these folks do have cognitive difficulties and memory problems, they often remember exactly what they drink. <laughs> um, they are dosing themselves, right? So being alcohol dependent means you have to be particularly aware of how much alcohol you're getting and what kind it is, and people have preferences. Um, so then we took all that information back to the lab and we used Bremer's um, uh, Bacchus calculator to calculate standard ethanol content. So when you see standard drinks here and in the rest of the presentation, that basically is the equivalent of one one and a half ounce shot of hard liquor, 80 proof, uh, a 12 ounce bud, or a 5 ounce glass of wine. So here uh, we could say on a regular drinking day, folks are drinking about 19 buds as the median. 29 buds is sort of the median peak drinking quantity in the past three days. So on the day they drink the most, how much did they drink? And I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of the flow throughout the study. Um, you can also see many of the, as I mentioned before, they're multiply affected by different things, not just disorders that we consider in sort of the medical world, but also a, a, a gamut of lifestyle issues that come up, um, such as being jailed. Um, that affected, for sure, our participant um, recruitment and retention. So 45 people attended the information session with me, 42 consented. There's a 93% um, acceptance rate, and that'll be important, so remember that. Um, <clears throat> 36 qualified for the study. Um, the people who did not qualify were using opioid-based medication, basically with really accident prone, and every time we saw them, they had broken something else or were in another fight where they were getting opioids um, as a as medical treatment. Um, two people had AST, ALT values greater than five times the upper limit of normal, and we referred them to the primary care provider. Uh, one person had decompensated liver disease and actually kind of passed out in the session with Mark Duncan. So she was sent to the hospital right away. Um, one person was not alcohol dependent. <clears throat> we had 31 people receive the injection. Um, two people actually, de actually decided between the uh, baseline and week zero to go to inpatient treatment and to try again for abstinence. Um, at week one, we had all 31 people who received the first injection come back, which was great because that was our safety check-in, um, and we really wanted to check in with folks. We had 26 people receive the week four injection. The three people who elected not to receive any further injections after the first one all um, complained of site irritation. Um, and the doctors, you know, were uh, monitoring that but didn't feel that it was particularly severe. It was just uncomfortable for the clients and they did not want to uh, go on with medication at that point. Um, <clears throat> we did have people uh, uh, at the study, and you can see there there was a death after an unobserved fall that was deemed not related to the study medication that occurred between week one and week four. In week eight, we had 24 people complete the assessment and receive the injection. And those 24 people uh, returned for the final week 12 follow-up. So to go over our initial feasibility findings, 93%, as I mentioned before, consented to participate. And this is a particularly interesting number to me because we have some colleagues out on the East Coast who were working also with homeless people with alcohol dependence um, who had just gone through detox, and they uh, were doing a randomized controlled trial of extended-release naltrexone versus oral naltrexone. And they had a 93% rejection rate. 93% of people approached did not want to participate. And um, as any good scientist, they blamed that also on their participants. The title of their study is um, Homeless People, It's Not Feasible to Give Homeless People X, Y, and T, X because they're afraid of needles. So <laughs> I, I don't know what happened there. It might, and you know, in talking with colleagues who work in homelessness um, around um, the country this past summer, We've all kind of shared stories, too, about how all of our populations are really distinctive and very different. So it has to be that you know, they just have a very, they're working with a very different population of individuals. Um, and um, our, our sort of cultural um, and, and um, other factors um, that are kind of determine our population here in Seattle is certainly distinct. 
86% of people approach qualified pr for participation. I think that was really due to the sort of low barrier nature of our inclusion and exclusion criteria. 86% um, received the initial injection. 84% continued after the initial injection. And of all those who received the first injection, 77% uh, stayed for our week 12 follow-up. So this was much more feasible because I remember Rick and I talking at the, before we started the study, like, we don't really know if this will work or whatever. We just want to know if people will come and get a shot in the butt. That was basically our primary goal with this pilot study. And we were pretty blown away, not just by people showing up, but by people's <laughs> enthusiasm for participating in the study. Yes? Susan, I, I think that the different acceptance rate had a lot to do with how we approach folks. Or, you know, the, the, they meet you where you are and let you, you know, we're, we're trying to help you to get better in something you want to get better right. versus, <coughs> I guess, is a, a different approach. So I think... It's uh, very likely, yeah. I just have a, it's so dramatically different yeah. that it has to have something to do with it. Um, I, think, I think so, and I actually talked to the first author of that paper. We had some email exchanges, and he was um, kind of unclear about um, what they actually did say in recruiting. I actually asked some questions around that. And he said, well, you know, we asked if people were interested in changing their alcohol use, but it must have been something... I mean, they were definitely focused on changes in alcohol use. They really focused in on that, whereas we had a much more open-ended sort of approach. Um, and it, it felt a little bit, the way they wrote about it, felt a little bit like it might have been use reduction oriented. Um, but it was hard to tell, and he wasn't very specific, even after I followed up on that a couple times. So, um, yeah, it, probably the flavor was, was different as well. So some initial safety findings, just to show you. <clears throat> our liver transaminase, and actually I would like to add that our partners are pretty amazing. Um, so we get to work with people who um, really do engage the community. We go out into the community to where people live. So, I mean, one thing is they would do working in a detox facility after people had come out of detox and trying to offer them um, the medication. So, um, you know, not on these people's turf, so to speak. Um, um, I think it means a lot to people that we show up and we, um, we show up for them versus expecting them to show up for us um, and that we are pretty disarmed in these settings. You know, it's just me and a physician and the future will be, you know, our assessment personnel and one physician. So um, we don't have that whole entourage of medical um, staff that might intimidate a person from participating and our partners are really amazing at bridging. Um, the uh, their community-based world to our world as well. So they definitely helped us um, get an end to working with these um, folks. And we really care about these people, and we um, check in on them when they go to hospital, and we I see them every week still. So, um, you know, it's, it, it is sort of about a longer-term investment in the community versus just going in and doing some helicopter research and extracting the resources from the community and leaving again. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about the safety, um, we wanted to follow people's liver transaminases, their AST and ALT over time. Um, and we were really particularly interested in this because we had some concern, or our partners had some concerns at the beginning of the study due to the black box warning on um, naltrexone um, about hepatotoxicity. So there were some concerns there, and we tracked this over time. And as you can see, these values remained relatively flat over the course of the study. Some people's AST and ALT values did you know, spike a little bit at some point in the study, um, but uh, none of them kind of, you know, saw that dramatic spike that we would expect from a hepatotoxic effect. And we also found that the side effects, and these were measured by the safety measure that was created by Bankhold Johnson for the very large um, combined study that was done a few years ago. Um, you can see on the y-axis there is a median number of symptoms reported on the safety by participants. Um, we had to use that sort of rough and dirty um, analysis for this particular pilot. We just didn't have the information on the severity of the symptoms um, in the way that we could use. But you can see that that remains relatively flat as well with a small spike at the week one. Um, and again, what we found is that the symptoms of alcohol dependence that our clients experience really on a daily basis really map onto their experience um, of, uh, of XRNTX. So it was really hard to parse the two apart. Um, and we did see people for whom XRNTX was particularly effective actually just their symptoms um, or their side effects dropping off dramatically over time just due to the changes they had made in their alcohol use. 
We found that serious adverse events were unrelated to the study medication. As you can see, this is a very high utilizing population. Even three months prior to baseline, there's a lot of utilization, particularly of Harborview services. So thank you, everyone out there, for taking good care of these clients. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, that remains, I mean, if we're going to divide that by three, that remains relatively stable or goes down somewhat over time. We also had a gentleman who actually became abstinent at the end of the study who had pretty severe COPD problems that he was hospitalized for in the end that were not related to the study medication but that do kind of inflate um, some of this over on the right side of the, the graph there. We had one death in the study, as I mentioned. It was due to a subdermal, he, uh, subdural hematoma due to an unobserved fall. Um, and um, this is not very, it, it's tragic every time it happens, but it's actually pretty typical for this population. There's not a week that doesn't go by that I won't walk into 1811 and one of my clients just face will be just completely black from bruises, from falls. Um, it happens on a daily basis and um, this one was particularly fatal. So we also, as I mentioned, we were listening harm reduction goals from individuals, right? So we really wanted to see what kinds of harm reduction goals do they generate? Able, able to generate harm reduction goals, which I knew they would be able to, but um, we wanted to prove that as well. And the reason why is we wanted to um, have this this issue with Tucker Carlson. I don't know if you know him. He's like the commentator with the bow tie. Um, and before 1811 Eastlake opened up, he has this great quote that is like, um, you know, sitting around in your apartment and drinking all day. That's a dream for a lot of winos. That's a dream for a lot of Americans. I think that's what Kevin Federline essentially does. The challenge here is really remembering who Kevin Federline was. That was a different time. <laughs> it's 11 it's like it's been around for a while. But, um, but that really made me angry because what he's basically saying is that these individuals don't have goals like the rest of us. Their dream is just to sit around and drink all day. And I was pretty sure that wasn't the case. And in fact, that's not what we found. No one said to us, you know, Mark, I really just want to smoke more crack. No one said that. And in fact, everyone had goals that seemed pretty reasonable and, and actually surprisingly mainstream for people who have spent a lot of their lives living in a pretty marginalized environment. Um, we had some, this is just a quick and dirty breakdown. Actually, um, some of my students who are here today and um, some of my employees um, are working with me right now on doing a very um, intense quali quali um, qualitative analysis, a content analysis on these data. So this is just sort of a quick and dirty breakdown of what I saw initially in the data. But we saw people wanting to engage in traditional recovery, some people wanting to get a sponsor, and one of our participants who did become abstinent during the study wanting to stay abstinent. Um, I actually was surprised by that and a little like, wait a minute, that wasn't supposed to happen. So it kind of took me a little bit by surprise. Um, we do see some use, so we had people um, stating that they wanted to drink eight beers a day versus their current 12. Um, and when I say beers, <coughs> I mean 24 ounce 211s, steel reserve. Um, making three beers last all day, so spacing out drinks, but really um, kind of sta using it to maintain or stave off alcohol withdrawal versus to um, really um, spike the BAC. Reducing harm, so avoiding blackouts, avoiding withdrawal drinking safer, switching from whiskey to beer, which is a good choice for a lot of these individuals who have a lot of GI problems, and whiskey is a little bit harder for them to take over a long period of time. Drinking in a safe place, so not drinking on the streets where they could get arrested, um, not drinking with people they don't know that they might get in trouble with. Um, improving quality of life. Actually, quality of life issues were made up m about half of the goals that people um, brought up. And these were things like going to the library, um, you know, re-engaging with their artistic hobbies. A lot of the people we work with are chefs and artists. Um, and reconnecting with family. Now, this doesn't look immediately like it would really make a lot of sense in an alcohol treatment study, right? Um, going to the library. But this particular client, when Mark was interviewing her, <coughs> said, well, you know, I really want to go to the library. I want to get out, get some fresh air. And he said, oh, you know, that's great. Have you done that before? And she was like, yeah, there was a time when I went to the library every day. And he said, well, what are, the, you know, what are the barriers for you right now? What, what's making it hard to get there? And she said, well, you know, I find that when I'm up drinking until 3 o'clock in the morning, it's really hard to get up the next day and make it to the library. So without him even prompting her, she came around to name what was one of the barriers to uh, achieving her quality of life goals was really her own drinking. And she was able to work on it from that angle instead of on an from an imposed angle. 
And we saw that not only were people able to generate harm reduction goals, but their harm reduction goal development actually increased over time. This surprised me too because I have a silly idea about what harm reduction goals would be. That would be people create these harm reduction goals at the beginning and they achieve them and it's like over. But actually people really got good at you know, putting goals out there for themselves and they kind of liked achieving them. It was fun for them. So they generated more and more goals with our study physicians that they could then work on. And it, it didn't occur to me at the time, but <clears throat> most of these goals, um, actually they maintained over time. So they would rename them every week and they would achieve them every week, but then they would say, I still want to work on that. And then they would kind of keep that in the queue. And so as you can see here, of the people's baseline goals that they set at week zero, they achieved 38% of those when they came back for week one. But as I mentioned before, they got better at achieving their goals over time, and this was a significant increase in how they were able to achieve their goals from baseline to achieving their goals at week eight. So that was exciting to see, sort of this learned effect of people learning how to set goals that were achievable for themselves, concrete goals, and then um, really seeing that boost, that increase in a sense of self-efficacy around being able to make positive behavior changes. And then I mentioned we worked on safer drinking steps. And these were the top five-ish, sort of. I just kind of like scanned through and um, did some quick and dirty analysis. But basically we saw that most of the top five were buffering. So from that top group of safer drinking strategies I mentioned, not really necessarily committing to changing your drinking or the amount that you're drinking in any particular way, but definitely working on trying to buffer the effects of alcohol. And then the, the final two down on the bottom, you can see slower or spacing drinks. That was from the second category, um, as well as drinking in a safe place. So we didn't really have people come out a lot and say, I just want to get abstinent, right? That's not what happened. Um, and we saw that people um, began endorsing more safer drinking steps over time. This particular um, increase was not statistically significant, but again, we were for all of these analyses, I want to remind you all, we're working with 24 people, so our power to find statistically significant effects where they potentially exist are not really there. So we'll see in the larger study if this holds. And then finally, we looked at alcohol-related outcomes. And um, what we saw is even though, as I just showed you, people weren't really setting out to really reduce their drinking or um, to get abstinent, that's what we saw. So we saw a statistically significant 34% reduction in the number of standard drinks they were consuming on their peak drinking occasion in the past 30 days, from 29 drinks down to 19 drinks on a, on a peak day. And these are the days actually when the falls happen the most. So these are the days we really do want to target um, the most. Um, drinking frequency uh, decreased by 17%, so people started working more and more non-drinking days into their month. And this was a little bit due to a couple people who did achieve abstinence, but we're using the medians here, and we, I used um, Wilcoxon signed ranks test so that it wouldn't be too pulled off by uh, a mean that's based on a normal distribution. So really what we saw was a few people getting abstinent and then a lot of people basically tapering their drinking to the point that they really could afford to work in non-drinking days. We also saw a 60% reduction in alcohol-related problems. This was as measured by the SIP2R, Miller's measure from the University of New Mexico. And this is exciting to see because the SIP2R doesn't just measure intrapersonal problems, right? It measures interpersonal problems as well. So these are problems that can affect the community, um, getting into fights with neighbors, um, getting in trouble with the police. So it was nice to see this reduction that can not only improve quality of life for individuals themselves, but also for the community. And we saw a 33% reduction in alcohol craving. This was, of course, the mechanism of change that we had wanted to see um, given the hypothesized clinical mechanism of naltrexone. And we did indeed see that. This was as measured by the um, Penn Alcohol Craving Scale, the PACS. And for those who are skeptical a little bit about alcohol self-report in this group, we found that ethylglucuronide, which is a metabolite of alcohol that is excreted into the urine, and it can detect alcohol use, heavy alcohol use, particularly the kind of heavy use that our participants engage in um, three to five days um, prior. Um, we found that the concentration of ETG in creatinine um, went down uh, quite a bit, in fact, significantly. Um, as you can see here, so that really mapped on to the self-reported decreases that we saw in alcohol use as well. And I think most importantly, it was really exciting to do follow-up um, assessments with folks and hear some of their comments about how the program 
had affected their lives. So one of our um, clients said, this program is really helping. My daughter asked me the other day, Mom, why didn't they make this drug years ago? You're doing so good, and I'm so proud of you. That means a lot to me. Um, speaking to sort of the power of naltrexone, one of the clients said, one of the things I'm excited about, sometimes I'll start the third beer, and I just put it back in the fridge. Several times I've stopped drinking. My body doesn't want it anymore. But my favorite client is this one right here. He never took credit for the changes at all. In fact, he was always a little irritated with the fact he had made so much progress with his drinking. He said, oh, no, no, I feel the Vivitrol has made progress. I'm down from three-fifths of 100-proof vodka a day to two-fifths of 80-proof vodka. And he did say that the only reason why he had gone from 100-proof to 80-proof is because that store that was closest to him wasn't selling anymore. So it also has to do with that high-impact area that they've done downtown. But, um, but yeah, he, um, he definitely was able to make those changes in his drinking. And 63% of participants who received the full dose elected to continue the medication off study. Unfortunately for us, even though we tried really hard to hook people up with their primary care providers and we really tried to increase access to this medication, um, right now the state policy is such that really to get access to Vivitrol and to oral naltrexone, you have to be enrolled in a state um, certified addiction program, which typically requires abstinence. You have to be abstinent for seven days ahead of time, and you can really only get it for a very, um, for a very short period of time, three to six months tops, which we're kind of thinking is not going to be the right kind of situation for our clients, probably need more of like a maintenance dose of naltrexone over time. So that's something that we're hoping that our work can start to shed light on, so we might be able to change things maybe at the state level and increase access to this medication, particularly for the people who need it the most. So our initial conclusions from all this is that NRX, XR, NTX paired with brief counseling is a promising support for alcohol harm reduction. Even though we did not ask participants to change their drinking in any way, they showed significant biovalidated reductions in alcohol craving use and problems. And these findings suggest homeless people with alcohol dependence are motivated for positive behavior change as long as they can make those changes on their own terms. Um, and individuals can set and achieve goals to reduce their alcohol-related harm and improve quality of life. And as I mentioned briefly before, this study had um, really laid the foundation for us to write um, a, an R01 grant application to NIAAA. And we found out this summer we received that, um, that money to conduct this study called Harm Reduction with Pharmacotherapy. That's going to be a four-arm, three-month randomized controlled trial of extended release naltrexone plus harm reduction counseling. Um, we'll have a six-month follow-up this time so we can look at um, potential uh, treatment decay effects. And we're going to have um, the four arms of extended release naltrexone plus harm reduction counseling, placebo plus harm reduction counseling, harm reduction counseling alone, and assessment only. And that way we'll be able to parse apart, you know, do we need this expensive medication, or is it enough in some ways for our clients to sit together with a friendly physician who helps them work towards their goals? This is a scientific question that we can answer um, with this particular study. And if we find that the effects of harm reduction counseling and the medication are synergistic, then we can make that argument at a policy level that the medication should be made more available. Um, so we have started that as of August 1st, and we will definitely be back to tell you all more about that. And most important, I want to thank the whole team for all the work. Most people who worked on the pilot did it for free. Um, none of us really got paid off of that <laughs> at all. Um, so I really appreciate everyone's work. Um, all the folks here at UW Harborview, um, Rick, um, Reese, Andy Saxon, um, Mark Duncan and Brian Smart, who are study physicians, Joe Mayer, who is our independent safety monitor for the study, Emily Taylor, who's here, our research assistant. Um, and I don't know if anyone is here from the Harborview High University or Case Management Center. No? Well, they were awesome, so <laughs> they're fantastic to help us maintain contact with some of our clients over time. And um, I also want to thank our partners at the Downtown Emergency <laughs> Service Center, particularly the <laughs> ATM and residents who continue to let us into their home and into their lives. And um, to the REACH team, who, and we've been working very closely with them and with MCADS to make this happen, um, both with REACH and the Sobering Center. So um, we want to thank all of those folks for helping out. And if anyone has any questions regarding these slides, you can contact me. And um, thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone does have a question, yes. Two questions. One is, mm -hmm. 
you mentioned about mandating the counseling with uh, Medicaid. Is that limited just to like, people that have Medicaid funding versus any of Right, so yes. I didn't specify that. So we did have some people who were on Medicare, and actually they had unlimited access. Um, private insurance works differently, but none of our clients have private insurance. Um, most of our clients were Medicaid clients, but that was actually an inclusion criterion of sorts because we weren't able to get a lot of samples for the study, so we really had to mainly take Medicaid-funded um, clients. Yeah. And then the second question is, I would guess, but maybe you have a different experience, trying to get somebody into a counseling which is going to allow reduction approach, that would be a challenge. Yeah, right now there's nothing available outside of what we're doing, really. Um, so it is it is definitely a challenge. Um, I know DESC is a state certified um, provider of services, so actually they've become pretty flexible um, with clients, but it is it is a challenge pretty much. And outside of Seattle, it's it's the barriers are much higher, so that's true. Andy? I just want to comment that you mentioned the box warning and that oh, was put on yes. um, oral naltrexone when it was first FDA approved in 1984 and just this summer uh, the FDA removed the right. box warning so there is no warning right. about that was a month ago causing liver disease right that's actually a very rare event for those to ever be removed so yeah I'll prescribe it without worrying too much about her I failed to mention that that's yeah. true it's very good news yeah so and really that was just because it's hepatotoxic if it's um, administered in I think they had found for seven times the currently recommended daily dose so for doses at like 350 milligrams right now 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams is the typically recommended dose um, so those were studies that were done back in the in the 80s and, and 90s um, and actually there were no real hepatotoxic no serious adverse events um, correlated with hepatotoxicity I don't think with Vivitrol itself it was really on there because of the oral form and what we argued with our IRB, which was a difficult fight, was basically that um, you know there's no way they can get more of this. It's not like they can take the whole bottle and chug it all because we're giving them an extended release injection once a month. So it was a little bit difficult to explain to people this black box warning is really applying to sort of a different formulation and also to a different um, dosage than what would be applied well, in the study. Let, let me say something else really quickly too to, to orient people. I think students said something at the beginning, but you know, this is a population that, that nobody wants. Um, they've been, they're chronically public inebriates, you know, that they don't fit into typical alcohol treatment. When we would see an intake for that patient, not uncommonly we'd see glucoses in the 40 to 45 <laughs> range, maybe 50, maybe 36, maybe 70. Potassium's 3.3. Uh, liver enzymes, 300% over the highest range of normal. That would be a fairly typical person that we'd be enrolling in this study. Um, if you looked in that person's medical history, they probably had $100,000, $500,000 worth of medical care in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. including multiple admissions for subdural, multiple admissions for bleeding uh, uh, through varices, um, being run over, hit by cars, trauma, you name it. Mm -hmm. So they're a hugely expensive population that that doesn't fit into mental health, that doesn't fit into typical alcohol treatment. And what they've historically gotten is a detox jail and uh, expensive medical admissions and bouncing around. And so the first step was to enclose them as what the 1811 and, and other kinds of efforts that are going on but then the issue is, okay, if you sort of enclose them, what else can you do? And you can certainly do, we built, Susan and, and, and the team developed this integrated psychosocial and pharmacologically based treatment. And you might say, oh wow, 30% decrease, you know, so what? Um, I think you need to think about this population a little bit like we think about severe chronic recurrent schizophrenia and severe chronic recurrent bipolar disorder. These are people that if we had in the mental health center and they were 50 years old and they had big time multiple decompensations and treatment <coughs> history, if, if we saw those kinds of increases there over the course of three months, 30% improvements in a lot of different things, we would be very thrilled. So it's, it's a different kind of population than, than typically we think of as kind of earlier stage alcohol problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just so, 
you know, on the primary care end, you know, people get a PBD, you have the black box, and then the on the acute care end, you know, you have one patient die from the and, you know, this is, Rick's pointing out, this is a multiply recurrent traumatized population. So you're on this depot uh, now, Hopkins, and you come in for an injury, and you're going to get IV morphine if you're in a lot of pain. I mean, how much, do, what are these sort of black boxes on the acute care and we have to worry about it, and, and how can we stay in touch with you as you pilot this so that we don't, you know, give morphine and ruin everything? Well, right. Well, so Yagata was actually really helpful um, in helping us spread the word over in the emergency part of the hospital in general, um, and getting the word over to the ER as well that the study was going on, um, and we'll continue to to let people know about that. People also um, received um, ID it's tags. It's also an issue for the sort of you guys want this to have legs, and we're just right. I mean, you know here we are at Harvard, we're happy to pilot anything, but like. What, should we, what is the sort of, you know, death or, you know, I mean, what, what, what do we have to worry about in terms of simultaneous administration or a depot? Andy, go ahead. Yeah, so it, it's uh, really pretty simple. Um, for anesthesiologists, I wouldn't recommend the psychiatrists do this on their own, but um, you will use um, IV morphine or IV fentanyl at high enough doses to override the blockade. Uh -huh. And I, I haven't had this happen with a injection naltrexone patient, but I had a patient I had on oral naltrexone who got acute appendicitis, and so right. he got but admitted. But it's okay if someone comes in with an injury that has an injury. Yeah, he got yeah. 35 yeah. milligrams no, of morphine. You just have to override it. Okay, and, override it. And, okay. and you want to make sure your endotracheal tube is right, right there at the bedside yeah, yeah, in case you're doing too much. <laughs> Yeah, so you have to you have to have the the setup of a lo like this level one trauma center is perfect. If we were out in a rural area, there would be a lot more concerns about this. But yeah, you have to ensure the pa the respiratory pathway is kept free, and you have to have an anesthesiologist there to there are know what the more of those, right? well. But there's I mean, there's several hundred thousand people on Vivitrol nationally, and as far as I know, there's not one single case report of something bad okay. happening, okay. and people have gotten into auto accidents, etc. And so you can sort of look at it. Any time that opiates are actually going to be necessary to acute care treatment, maybe a pulmonary embolism or something, people are going to be monitored uh, okay. and on breathing anyway. So it's not necessary to use an oral test dose of naltrexone to make sure that the person can tolerate the Drug. We didn't do that in the pilot. We actually opted against that, and that is done sometimes, but we, yeah. Yeah, Andy. and I actually recommend against that because <coughs> it, it does have side effects, and people could take the oral <coughs> dose. And actually, the pharmacokinetics are different because you get, there's a, uh, there's an active metabolite, and you get, with the oral, you get 10 times the uh, proportion of um, metabolite to parent drug, and the, the metabolite may cause more of the side effects, but they take the pill, they get nauseated, they go, oh, don't ever, I'm never right. taking that shot. So it's better just with, with yeah. people for alcohol use disorder, better just to go right to the shot if they're willing to take it. Yeah. And you get the peaks and troughs with the oral. I mean, if you have to do it over a period of time. And also, I think, you know, it hits their stomach. A lot of these people have nausea anyway. Um, it's really nice that the, the, the injectable form bypasses both the stomach and the liver, so it doesn't touch all of those areas that are usually already damaged so yeah and the other thing would you be if we assembled the, the patients uh, would you be interested in coming up to Tulela and uh, having including them in your study wow <laughs> <laughs> we can talk <laughs> we have some other things going along that line there okay cool yes so the other question I have is what percentage or did you guys ask about alcohol withdrawal seizures in these things. Mm -hmm. It's just more of a fun fact than anything else. Yes, we did, and I didn't break that out today. Um, but I'm just, if I can just think about it for a second, I would probably say about 40, 30, or 40 percent had experienced them in the previous three months at baseline. <clears throat> so um, it's a, and that's where a lot of the falls actually come from, is also like petty mall seizures that um, just cause them to kind of blank out for a second, slip and fall. Um, so sometimes they aren't even sure if they're having seizures. They second guess it too, but yeah, we seizures are common. We talked about this at the beginning about what, what if somebody actually really just like stops drinking? Right. Aren't they going to be at risk of seizures and all that? And so Andy and I and you know, 
Brian, and we all said, oh, nobody's going to have that good a response. <laughs> well, at least one person did have that good a response and started going to bad alcohol withdrawal. And yeah. so we had to kind of rush in there with some gabapentin and other kind of things. Well, and she, and actually this part, this particular participant didn't really understand that alcohol withdrawal was that bad. You know, even though the study physicians had gone over that, she didn't really understand because she had not often gone through, like had not often been abstinent for that long of a period of time. So it really was a matter of talking her into drinking a little bit each day. And then we actually, because her memory's so bad, we actually, I would write in big letters and put it next to her bed, like, please drink something today, um, because she just would kind of not do it. Um, and she was so excited about the progress she made, and she was so excited about the fact she didn't have the same cravings. So we did have to work with people on their terms to figure out some way that they could get a little bit of alcohol and to taper effectively down if that's what they wanted to continue to do. Yeah, that's one of those things about homegrown psychopharmacologists. Is that it's when we come in and uh, inject something else, mm -hmm. pardon me, uh, that disrupts their usual way of keeping from having a seizure right. or whatever. Right. And right. They don't quite get that mm -hmm. until something starts to get exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's one of the reasons we use the injection is they they may not get a lot of things, so we right. want to make sure that use the injection. It's once a month. We know whether it's there or not. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to rely on oral medicine that may or may not be taken, may or may not be thrown up, may or may not be absorbed, may or, you know, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. In one of the last slides, I think you were 60 some odd percent that wanted to continue after the research, after the study. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in what way? What happened to them? Right. So um, some people were because people who had already a pretty good relationship with their primary care provider and would show up to appointments there um, were able to um, to uh, to at least get a little bit of oral naltrexone. We did um, have two people. Um, one person who was on Medicaid, Medicare could get the injectable form. The unfortunate part was that the nurse who was then injecting him in practice thought, asked him if he wanted it in his gluteal muscle or in his arm. Mm -hmm. And she gave it to him in his arm. So that was a, like, you know, it's a little bit, we had to go in and do some, like, we educated the doctor about it, but he didn't let the nurse know that that was not an option. So we, we've been doing a lot of, like, education in the community. We've been talking to um, people at Pike Market Clinic and stuff, and they've been working with us pretty well. But for some folks who just did not have regular access to a primary care physician or, or, or a nurse, prescribing nurse, um, they, they just couldn't get it. Um, or for people where their Medicaid then lapsed. Um, so as much as we tried to, we worked really hard to try and connect people up, the system has a lot of gaps in it that we um, have been really struggling against. And just to say something about the system, um, state Medicaid actually a allowed us a, a dispensation to use this without people having to go through formal addiction treatment. So, so Deb Cummings at the state level, was very supportive and actually Dan Wessler from here is now the state Medicaid medical director and a lot of the limitations on these medicines will be evaporating over the next few months. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you.